actually Tamara and I, Tamara and I actually um, together partnered on a talk at the um, American Dairy Goat Association last year. Um, and it was really, it was two veterinarians. It was to a veterinary CE event. So I think it was really eye-opening to the veterinarians um, because their experience with dogs is generally, you know, dogs, house dogs, you know, foo-foo dogs, uh, dogs that sleep on the couch, that kind of thing. And it's, it's not that some of our rock bosh don't do this well, I guess, but um, they're really, we're not very familiar with um, what livestock protection dogs do. <laughs> how they do it and why they do it. So that was sort of the nidus of the talk that we gave. And then Tamara had asked me to um, talk with the group a little bit about sort of basics, basic veterinary care, things like vaccinations and stuff like that. So, um, but the first thing, of course, um, uh, most of you know this or do and, and, and buy into this proposition that our dogs are really valuable employees. Their investment that um, not only protect our investment in our livestock, but they themselves are an investment and really a part of our success. Um, they have a huge impact on our bottom line. If we're having losses, that's definitely not a good thing. Um, and minimize the stress and loss on, on, on the stock and for us as owners, whether it's predators, theft, that kind of thing. It's always hard, um, especially like in my situation with my dairy goats, they all have names. Um, they're handled twice a day on the stand. Um, taken to shows, that kind of thing. So it's, um, you know, kind of, kind of like golden retrievers with others and losing an animal like that to uh, predation would, is just devastating. Um, and caring for them properly, of course, why? Because it helps them do their job more effectively if they're healthy and they feel good, they can do it more effectively. You also have them as a Employee, an employee for a longer period of time. Um, we even have had, you know, older dogs, 10 and 12, and I just lost a, I had a Pyrenees that came to us as a rescue who worked out as a fabulous livestock protection dog. And we're guessing he was 13 or 14 years old when we finally had to put him down. So that's just a huge long life for any large breed dog. Um, and then also just sort of our responsibility to be good at animal stewards. So the things I wanna to cover today, and hopefully I'm not going too fast for folks, but um, we're gonna talk a little bit about socializing. This is not really meant to be a, a discussion on how to socialize dogs or and things like that, but I wanna make some of the distinctions uh, for everyone here so that as you converse with your veterinarians or even as you're looking at behavior of your animals, you may be able to kind of put things a little bit into context. But we're also going to talk about vaccinations, sort of core, core type vaccinations, what they really ought to have. Um, and then maybe some vaccinations that are what, what are called by the healthcare community non-core. Um, and those would be things that are really sort of dependent on what you have going on in your area of the country. Like we've got somebody here from Alabama or Georgia, um, other parts of the country. Um, they may, you may, guys may see different things in your area than let's say I do here in Texas. I'm in the vicinity with, with Tamara and Ruth Ann. Um, so routine maintenance type of things as well with these dogs. Again, this is about keeping them healthy, happy, and working. Um, so Tamara, the picture that she and I've just plagiarized um, without uh, with abandon here, but they, because they're just such good pictures. Um, so live protection, livestock protection dogs, just in general, are unique from other dogs, um, just because they can bind bind bond with livestock. Um, and I've often had people wanting to buy goats from me and I start talking about what's your setup, fencing, shelter, protection. Oh, well, we've got, you know, a couple of German shepherds or a border collie or a Rottweiler or a terrier. So we don't need to look at getting a protection dog. And then we have to have a discussion about every dog has a job and is genetically designed to do that job. Um, so the making of a successful OPD, um, certainly socialization is part of it. We always think about bonding with our, our stock and they want, we want them to you know, be sort of part of the herd, but they also do need to be socialized. And this is my personal opinion as well as my opinion you know, as a veterinarian um, and, and really from the perspective of sort of the happiness of the dog. They need to be around people. Um, it's, socialization starts at birth takes very little time, 20 minutes per week, 
you know, prior to eight weeks, just kind of messing with them and saying puppy, 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 and get get your voice associated with the person who's bringing them food um, and building some trust and respect between you and the dog. Um, this is um, contrary to some old school, old guard attitudes about dogs in general and protection dogs in particular is uh, you don't want to handle them. They won't bond with their stock or they won't protect their stock, you, that kind of thing. You don't want them too friendly. And what I've found with all of our dogs that are really well socialized is if anyone comes, you know, over and or I'm and I go out to the pasture with them, or it's just me, they come over to say hello, um, little sniff sniff. Um, we try not to let them do the crotch sniff poke, but some of them want to do that because that's how dogs say hello. Um, and after they realize that we're not, we don't have any food or cookies for them, they just kind of wander off and go back to their goats. That's to me is a well socialized dog, not really pestering us, but at the same time, he's willing to come up and say hello. Um, so puppies are called, they're fed, handled, um, turning them on their backs, um, some, you know, eventually given names, that type, that type of thing. Um, so socialization also, and this was something I hadn't really thought about, and Tamara and I had a lot of discussion as we built this talk uh, for, the, for the veterinarians, is that socializing means also just accepting restraint. And really, as a veterinarian, that's important if I need to look at an animal, give it a shot, fix something, stitch something up, whatever, um, it, that's important. But also from the perspective of um, if they're used to being restrained, then they won't maim or kill itself if let's say they get stuck in something like a snare or you know, in a fence line or, or something, something like that. So um, this is also important. Doesn't mean you have to have them leech, leash trained and doing attention healing and that sort of thing. Um, but that they should be willing to um, you know, be able to be still and restrained and not freak out. So socialization, and I said this earlier, socialization is not the same as bonding. So socialization takes place. We work with the dogs in the pasture with their livestock. Um, we have young dogs that learn to stay in their fences and they live in the pastures. They start out in the pastures. They're raised in the pastures. The first thing a recent litter of puppies I had, the first thing they saw, if it wasn't me or mama, it was goats that they were living with. Um, and if you have dogs that are roaming, there can be a lot of reasons for it. One is that they're not really truly bonded to their stock, or perhaps they're not neutered and there's a dog in heat down, you know, a mile down the road or whatever. Um, and one of the big things about socialization versus bonding, um, and I do see people do sometimes start puppies in the house and seem to be successful with it, but uh, you know, I always find it interesting, you know, well, we brought home a new puppy and they show it sleeping on the couch with the kids, um, but it's supposed to be the livestock protection dog. And I wonder, you know, if that can impact the animal actually bonding with their stock. Um, and then this blue button here at the bottom, <laughs> Um, they're started with their stock and often um, putting them in a small bonding pen in the barn, especially if you have stock that's maybe a little flightier like sheep um, to where, you know, they get to start running and a puppy's going to, oh, it's running. I need to chase it. That's just sort of a natural thing. Play behavior, not, not necessarily prey drive, but just playfulness. So if you can put them in a small, small confined area, like a large box stall with a bunch of its sheep, um, if it starts chasing and the sheep start running, the puppy gets run over and it learns pretty quickly that it just needs to sit still <laughs> until the sheep settle down. Um, we have goats and they don't tend to do as much of that. Um, the Nubians tend to be a little bit fearful of a new dog, um, but La Manchas are great with new dogs because in general, they're very curious and they usually walk up to the, the dog pretty assertively and kind of, you know, that seems like they're channeling the message, okay, I'm gonna kick your butt and then we can be friends. Um, and that seems to work really, really well with the dogs that we've had here. <coughs> so bonding with livestock. So that means putting them with the kind of animals they're gonna be. It doesn't mean that they can't bond with something later on in life, um, but, but that's, you know, ideally putting them with with animals. So if you are going to have, you know, uh, you know, a dog with, let's say sheep, um, you know, and then you transfer it to goats, they might think what's going on here or um, exposure to chickens and poultry. <laughs> That's one of the things that seems to be 
kind of a thing a lot of us deal with 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 dogs is the sort of natural instinct to you know that that's a snack running around with feathers on it kind of thing so um it is helpful if, if they can have or at least see other animals on the other side okay, those belong here as well um, and by doing that just keeping them with them it builds trust and attachment and that's going to be a lifelong kind of kind of thing with the animals Um, okay, um, spaying and neutering, just going to give a brief message here. Um, absolutely. Um, if you're not running a breeding program with and breeding with intent, um, you know, preserving genetics, we, we have challenges not being able to get new genetics out of Turkey. Um, and we need to really watch what we're doing with our gene pool. Um, that, you know, that's, that's something that the Better Bread program is all about as well, is preservation of um, the breed and our genetics, um, but also not getting ourselves into some sort of rabbit hole of genetic disorders like myelopathies or things like that, okay? Um, so absolutely spay and neuter, but with these big dogs, age is important. Um, and so we really want to wait until the growth plates close on the long bones. So usually 12 to 15 months is ideal for spaying and neutering at a similar time. A little bit of a challenge with that spaying at 12 to 15 months is um, one really needs to watch their bitches. They, they too tend to cycle later in life than most dogs, and they generally don't cycle before 15 months, but something you have to kind of be aware of and watch for and be prepared to address. And similarly with male dogs, I mean, they're reaching sexual maturity before their 15 months of age, certainly, and may begin to exhibit some um, male behaviors that maybe are not exactly what you want and need, need to watch for that and do some corrections. Um, and again, contrary to, you know, old wives tales, spaying, neutering doesn't affect how they guard, protect. It doesn't affect their bonding with their stock. It does inhibit roaming. It certainly stops mismates, um, and it certainly can help eliminate fighting, um, whether it's male on male or female on male or female on female. And we've actually had some pretty dominant females here at our place that um, we have to kind of be aware when we introduced a new female that you know there was going to maybe be a little discussion about who was in charge. Um, and then, of course, um, there's lots of costs and losses associated with leaving livestock protection dogs intact. Um, you, there's certainly risks and problems with well-being. Um, we, our recent litter, we really didn't miss a day in terms of the the female, the bitch, um, being with her livestock and 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 continuing to work for us. But we're kind of in a very small kind of set up. We're not acres and acres and you know, miles and miles of land here either. So we were really fortunate in that, that when we did have puppies, um, other than some excitement around whelping time and figuring out where she was going to actually keep the puppies, um, it was actually fairly smooth. So vaccinations, that was kind of the main part of today's talk. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we talk about core vaccines, and these are pretty much the vaccines we recommend for all dogs, um, whether they're um, diseases endemic to dogs or to the region of the country, um, diseases that pose potential public health significance. A good example of that, of course, is rabies. Um, and rabies is required by a law. Um, and then also just other ones that may pose the risk of severe disease, loss, loss, death, you know, things like parvo, um, those kind of those kind of things. And we'll we'll get into some other diseases as well that are maybe considered non-core, but again, depending on your situation, um, what kind of land you have, where your animals are, um, what your dogs have access to, um, can change something from being non-core to core. But in general, anything that's a core vaccine is just, it's needed all the, across the board, regardless of any sort of um, extenuating circumstances in your situation. And the only thing that might be considered or sort of pulled out of non-core, and I haven't seen it in any of the, of the, the Turkish breeds. Um, I, at one point, had a Siberian Husky as a house dog, and she had a very extreme reaction 
to um, the combination of parvo, you know, parainfluenza, lepto vaccine. Um, and we, we did get her vaccinated the first time, second time she kind of swelled up and, and I felt like I still needed to do a booster on her and I gave her a bunch of Benadryl and she still kind of swelled up. So after that, that dog did not for the rest of her life get another parvo distemper shot. However, instead of giving vaccines every year, I pulled blood and ran tigers on her. And what was quite interesting, that dog lived to be 12 and a half, 13 years old. And you know, even at the age of 12, she still had a significant titer for distemper and parvo, which were the two things that I was checking for. But that's an extenuating circumstance. That's an individual, individual issue that we had with that particular dog. So example of core vaccines, the standard puppy shots, annual boosters and rabies. Um, and the non-core, like I said, are not necessarily recommended unless there's a good chance that the dog will be exposed to the agent. And examples of non-core, um, leptospirosis, Lyme's vaccine, rattlesnake, and then canine influenza and border tella. And you can see I have some question marks there. Um, leptospirosis used to be really a, a disease um, that we would be concerned about in our livestock guardians where we have livestock tanks and cattle going into the tank and peeing and wild animals and deer and things like that exposures there we used to you know consider that but I for a typical house dog I wasn't really that worried about lepto like with that Siberian husky um, that does seem to be changing um, there seems to be a trend and it's not necessarily the variants of leptospirosis um, that's in the standard vaccine, which maybe is more of what our animals are exposed to in, in our stock tanks or whatever. Um, but city dogs are getting lepto and the feeling is it's just puddles on the street and, or maybe they do take, you know, the dog to a local, you know, lake or something like that, that has, you know, wild animals and fowl, and things like that swimming in it as well. Um, so something just to kind of keep our eyes and ears open for, but in general, we, we hit, we hit dogs with the lepto variety that is the most common um, problem in, in, for our dogs. Uh, Lyme's vaccine, definitely a regional thing, um, but Lyme's is moving. I mean, you always think of Lyme's as Northeast, East Coast, but it is definitely marching westward. Um, so again, depending on what's going on in your area, and this is these are conversations to have with your local vet in terms of what do I really need to do? Are, there, are you seeing cases of lepto? Are you seeing cases of Lyme's? Those kind of things to consider vaccinating. Um, canine influenza is another sort of newer vaccine. <laughs> Not something I ever worried about when I was actually in private practice, which has been a number of years ago doing small animal practice. Um, but it seems to be something that is raising some concern. Um, and it's again, something to watch out for. Um, if needed, you know, the animal should get the vaccine. But again, conversations with your veterinarian, are you seeing this? Is this something that's a problem in our area? Bordetella, um, also known as kennel cough, is part of one of the organisms in a complex that causes kennel cough. And again, it's something I don't worry about here with our dogs. Um, we're not going and getting exposed to a bunch of other dogs. Generally, Bordetella comes up in kennel situations where lots of string dog coming together for a week or a weekend, lots of barking and stress and things like that. So may or may not apply. <laughs> To our dogs. Um, and then in the middle there, rattlesnakes, I need to leave that out. Rattlesnake vaccine has been around for a while. Um, there's some data on, on it as far as it being effective from the perspective that if a dog gets a rattlesnake bite, probably still may need emergency care, but may not be as critical as if he had no vaccine whatsoever. So it's effective, but kind of limited efficacy. Um, so you wouldn't want to vaccinate a dog and then just throw them in a pit with rattlesnakes because that probably would not have a good outcome. Um, so we'll go back to the core vaccines and, and standard puppy vaccine. And the typical series is a, a series of three shots, at least two to four weeks intervals. So um, often we will you know, do them at six, eight, and then maybe 10 and 12. Um, but, but again, a lot of it depends on what you're seeing in your area. Um, 
if there's a you know a lot of parvo going around or a lot of distemper in wild animals then you may want to think about vaccinating the puppies every two weeks instead of you know doing an extension to four weeks i think it's really critical that we look at this six six to eight nine week interval that is when the vaccine is really going to have um important efficacy for the puppy that's a vulnerable vulnerable period of time and the reason why we do series of vaccines in dogs as well as goats or sheep or any other kind of young animal is that often they get immunity from their dam at birth through the colostrum and that colostrum gives them pretty darn good protection but it's what we call passive immunity they're not actually manufacturing their own immunity they're just carrying the immunity that mama gave them in the colostrum and that immunity begins to wane somewhere between six and eight weeks um, maybe nine weeks maybe ten weeks um, and with that, that waning the animal then becomes susceptible to the disease and can get sick but also at that point when there's not a lot of maternal immunity in the puppy system the puppy the puppy system will acknowledge receiving a vaccine and begin to develop its own immunity. If you have a puppy that's well protected with maternal antibodies with that passive immunity, let's say at six weeks and you go ahead and vaccinate it, the puppy's system, its immune system is likely going to say, oh yeah, I don't need to worry about that, I'm covered. Um, but then two weeks later at eight weeks when that immunity has waned and you give another shot, it says, oh, this is something new, I need to make a reaction to this and start building long-term immunity and responsiveness to to whatever the agent is that you're vaccinating for okay um and then often we give one more booster at the time of rabies shot which is usually 14 to 16 weeks okay so usually the first shots we give the puppies is the distemper hepatitis parvo and parainfluenza and the two biggies in here no, I don't want to poo-poo hepatitis and parainfluenza, but distemper and parvo are really the biggies, diseases of young puppies that can kill young puppies or make them extremely sick. Um, and then usually a six, seven, or nine way, they just different companies make different vaccines. Um, your veterinarian may have a recommendation of which you should use. Um, and so, you know, I would definitely go with their thoughts on the process for what's going on in your areas. Okay. Um, but we definitely want to give them one of these, these six, seven, nine ways because it does have the lepto in it, and sometimes more than one lepto type of lepto. Um, and we recommend that for puppies, you know, around 12 to 15 weeks of age. And then rabies, usually 14 to 16 weeks of age is what most, um, most people do. It's what states allow. If you give a vaccine, rabies vaccine to a puppy younger than 14 weeks of age, it may not be accepted by the state and their rules and regs as being a valid vaccination. Um, usually you give just one initial vaccine at this 14 to 16 week period. Um, and then we do a booster shot at one year. And then after that, depending on where you live, like here in Texas, if we're using, and depending on the type of vaccine you use, if you're using a killed vaccine, they're just good for a year regardless. But often we do what's called a modified live vaccine, which um, creates more of an antigen experience for the animal. So the animal, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna build some immunity and I'm gonna build some long-term immunity to this one. Um, so that's why we use the modified live rabies vaccine. Um, and here in Texas, law says that it needs to be boosted every three years. So you give a vaccine at one year of age, and then you um, come back three years later. At four, at, so the puppy is, you know, in theory, four years of age at that point and every three years. However, there are other things that factor into that. Um, and it's one of the things that um, we'll get into when we talk about rabies a little bit later in terms of adults. Um, so, but anyway, the puppy gets the first rabies shot at 14 to 16 weeks. So when we get to the adult, it, we're supposed to be doing annual boosters of the DHLPP. Um, and, you know, it's either a six way, seven way or a nine way vaccine, depending on how many other agents are in there. Sometimes coronavirus will be in there as well. Um, and that should be done annually. Uh, rabies annually after the puppy rabies, as I stated. 
Um, like I said, many states and areas allow um, additional boosters of rabies at three year intervals after the one year booster. Um, so it's a state specific as well as a vaccine type specific thing. Um, but booster maintenance is, is important and especially for rabies because our animals are out, out there, but also distemper parvo too. Um, you know, an older animal whose immunity wanes could potentially get parvo and get really sick. Um, I think my Siberian Husky showed that there often is long-term immunity, but we can't count on that um, being the case for all animals, um, as well as if it's just the parvo or the distemper portion of the vaccine, what about the hepatitis and the various lepto portions that are in that vaccine. Um, but when we talk about boosters, especially rabies, um, I think it really depends, again, on your area and the prevalence of rabies in the wild population. That's going to vary by regions of the country. So here in Texas, skunks are everywhere. And you pretty much can count on any skunk that you kill or find dead if you were to check its brain, it would have rabies. They're just, they're just carriers of rabies. Um, in my area on our property, we seem to have, even though I'm only on you know, five, six acres, we have a pretty good pressure of skunks. Um, I would say our dogs get sprayed or kill a skunk um, probably once every two months at least. Um, some of them learn quickly not to get sprayed, so there may be interactions we don't know about, um, but, but nonetheless, um, so I, as, I assume my dogs get, get a lot of chance to get exposed to rabies. Um, so we try to booster our rabies shot annually here, even though legally I don't have to. Um, and the nice thing about that then is that even if I'm a little bit late, let's say it's 15 months or whatever since I gave it, um, if for some reason we were to have, you know, God forbid the dog bite somebody, which um, just, it just doesn't happen. We don't have that kind of situation. Um, you know, with the bite in inhibition of our dogs, as well as people just don't come on property with barking dogs. Um, but if let's say I did have the dogs bite somebody, be in a dog fight, let's say, and somebody got bit, I at least can prove that I'm up to date on my rabies shot. So I don't have to do quarantine or destroy the dog or anything else like that. So I kind of feel like our dogs living outside, living in the pasture, um, that they have a greater potential to be exposed to rabies. I think our most recent skunk event was probably a month or so ago, maybe a little bit more. And it was during the middle of the day and a skunk was in the front pasture with the goats and the dogs started going crazy. Um, one of the dogs got sprayed um, and the other one just was running back and forth and actually gathered up all the goats and pushed all the goats away from the skunk. So the dogs were actually doing their job you wouldn't think of protecting them for rabies, but um, but protecting from the skunk, um, which was, and that's not the first time we've had that happen. And what, not even just with those two dogs, but with other dogs on our property too. They they definitely re recognize the skunks as not belonging and don't want any don't want them anywhere near their goats. Okay, so now we can get into non-core, um, and leptospirosis is one of those. Um, but like I said, it seems to be changing, especially for urban dogs. I don't think it's really changed much for our dogs, um, especially if you do have access to standing water tanks, um, areas uh, uh, where other wild animals have urinated. The spirochetes that um, for leptospirosis are, are usually excreted or are excreted in the urine of the, of the animal that has the disease. So it really anywhere where you know anything that potentially could have it as peeing is, is an issue. And that can be in your tanks or just puddles or on the ground. Um, so it is bacteria, what they call a spirochete, but it does call, cause acute kidney and uh, liver failure. Um, it's more common in warm clients and hot climates and high annual rainfall. So we're warm here in Texas. We are definitely not high annual rainfall, at least not this year, but certain parts of Texas may be. Um, Alabama would be another area. You probably have a lot more rain than we do here. Um, and it's found in most animals, livestock, cattle, pigs, sheep, wildlife, and all these animals, we, we see them all the time here on our property, um, passed through the urine into water sources, and then it can sit there, reside, and, and reproduce, and then infect an animal that comes in contact with it, ingests it. Um, and it's getting more complicated because there are numerous subtypes, and that's what the new lepto vaccines are all about. 
Um, but I think every state may be different in terms of the distribution. They, we certainly don't have 200 active varieties here in Texas, but I think there's four or five that Texas A&M University is actually tracking. And it's zoonotic. So um, the term zoonotic means that people get it. So it, you know, if your animals can get, get leapt out, you can too. And it'll do the same thing to your kidney and your liver as well. Um, and it's something to kind of keep in mind, and given your situation, if you have an animal that's, you know, kind of down and out, or, you know, you end up, oh, I really need to have the vet look at this animal, and they pull blood, and you're seeing abnormal kidney or liver function enzymes, hopefully your vet will be thinking about lepto, um, but um, there's other diseases, tick-borne diseases as well, they should be thinking about too, but something to say, you know, this dog lives in pasture and there's a tank and there's deer and everything else around uh, because they can actually um, test for leptospirosis. And if they know that that's what they have, then there's uh, appropriate treatment for that, antibiotics, IV fluids, so on and so forth. So another non-core mentioned was Lyme's disease, which um, this is um, a Borrelia organism. There's several different ones. It's also a spirochete. Um, and this is spread by ticks, tick bites. Um, and it's generally the deer tick, although there is some people who've done some research and feeling like it may be other ticks can carry it as well. Um, and it did really start in the Northeast Connecticut limes. Uh, Lime, Connecticut was where it got its name from. Um, woody area, tall grasses, that kind of places that are um, tick, tick havens. Um, and then, um, and it's also um, it's now spreading, like I said, to the mid-Atlantic states and upper Midwest. We're starting to see it here in Texas as well. Um, so it is marching west. Generally in forested areas, generally where pre pre uh, precipitation can sort of influence the amount of vegetation growth and exposure and that sort of thing. Okay, and then the third non-core that I'm gonna talk about today is the rattlesnake vaccine. Um, definitely here in Texas, not in my area. We have copperheads, but I know Crystal and, and those down by Lano um, likely have rattlesnakes as well. Tam, I don't think you've ever seen rattlesnakes up at your place, have you? Sorry, I called you out and I have to- No, okay. we, we don't have anything. You don't have them here. north of me either, okay. Um, so like I said, this vaccine was created. It is somewhat effective, but it's not like a be all end all, my dog is well protected. Um, and it's really designed for the Western, Western Diamondback rattlesnake. Um, I have heard people, uh, groups, dog groups, things like that, use it on, like I've got a friend next door who rescues border collies and they vaccinate the border collies for that. Um, and she was talking about it protecting against copperheads, which we have here. Um, and I, research shows that it doesn't really protect against copperheads. The other thing with the copperhead is that it's not nearly as toxic and potentially fatal as, it, as a diamondback. Um, that same Siberian Husky that could not handle vaccines got bitten on the nose uh, with a copperhead. I mean, I, I didn't see the snake, but I kind of heard her yip and saw, saw her with a, you know, two little blood spots on her muzzle. Um, and I immediately hit her with steroids and Benadryl and then loaded her up to take her to a friend's clinic, just in case. If she was going to crash and burn, I wanted to be right there at the clinic where we could, you know, do IVs or whatever else we needed to do. And by the time I got to my friend's clinic and walked into the waiting room with the Siberian Husky, somebody said to me, what a pretty chow chow. I've never seen a chow chow in that color before because her nose was so swollen. <laughs> so it does not protect it to provide any protection against venom of coral snakes or water moccasins um, or some of the other rattlesnakes like the Mojave or Eastern rattlesnake nor the copperhead. Okay. Um, and if somebody has really heavy duty rattlesnake pressure, um, one may want to consider um, doing the vaccine for sure, but maybe also in conjunction with snake aversion training. Um, and what I've read about snake aversion training is that it can be quite effective and pretty much lifelong. These dogs, once they've been trained, they remember, they don't necessarily need to have, you know, annual continuing education courses, refresher courses. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me, although I, we don't do it with our dogs, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if older dogs that have been snake aversion trained and understand this is not good, 
when they're working with younger dogs that they don't um, pass some of that on to them, um, you know, push them out of the way. You don't want to go see that kind of thing. Um, but I, I don't have any data to support that. I just, I see often older dogs um, working with younger dogs and kind of teaching them certain things. So that's always a possibility. Okay, so routine maintenance, we talked about um, vaccine routine maintenance, like annual distemper, most likely or, or, or potentially uh, annual rabies vaccine. But what are the other things that we need to do routine maintenance for our dogs um, to keep them healthy and working for a really long time? And one of them is super easy is heartworm prevention. Um, in our area, heartworms is a year-round year problem. We really don't <coughs> have that maybe one month a year where you might not have mosquitoes. Uh, the way heartworm disease is spread is by mosquitoes. It's one of the diseases I believe that was brought back um, with the military dogs from Vietnam. Um, but it spread like wildfire once it got into the mosquito population. And it used to be we had a daily pill for heartworm prevention. Um, now we've got monthly prevention. I don't know of anybody using, using daily prevention anymore. But we have um, monthly and there's now, now actually yearly injectable as well. Um, personally with our dogs, we just give them the monthly oral um, and drop the pill on the food. And for the most part, they eat it. If I see they don't eat it, I just pick it up and stuff it down their throats. Um, and like I said, it's mostly 12 months a year in many places. And here we, like, we may have a month or two where we could go without doing it. But for me, once I'm in a, a pattern and a schedule, it's just easier not to change that schedule. Just we have a calendar, we write it on there. When we give, give the pill, we put the sticker on there and then I mark the next month, you know, time for heartworm. Um, flea and tick control, same thing. <coughs> we talked about diseases like Lyme's disease. Um, Ehrlichia is another disease that can be spread. I didn't get into that, but um, it's another disease that can be spread by ticks. Um, and it's just a matter of comfort for the animals. Um, and I think also, I mean, our dogs are in close with the goats. I've never seen fleas on my goats ever. Um, I have found one tick on a goat's ear. Um, but generally, we're, we're not we're not overwhelmed with flea and ticks, e ticks either because we don't really give them a place to be um, because we don't allow that on our dogs by by doing flea and tick control. Um, I tend to do this a little more seasonally than the heartworm. For me, uh, flea and ticks are an issue in our area from about April to November, and so I use a once a month product, Frontline or something like that. But there are other topical products. There's oral products. Um, and, you know, just checking the dog regularly, or you just see the dog scratching, um, is often, you know, the time, time to start doing something before, you know, you have hot spots or an animal that's anemic or other secondary problems like tick-borne disease, like Lyme's or Ehrlichia. So those kind of things, you know, can be prevented just by keeping the, the, um, the insects off of them, off of the dog. <coughs> um, Hot spots, um, and you're going to sense a, a theme here with all of my stuff. Everything with our dogs, if we can identify it early, it's easier to treat. It's easier to heal up. So a starting hot spot that's the size of a quarter or a dime or uh, whatever is a whole lot easier to deal with than you know, uh, you know this huge raw area now that this animal has developed. Um, uh, the same thing with fly strike. In general, our dogs are not bothered by them much, um, but I have one white dog that seems to get fly strike on the edges of her ears. And so she's one that when we see that starting to happen, she doesn't want to be sprayed with fly spray. So, um, but she will allow me to put something like squat on the edges of her ears. And if I just do that every other day, we have we don't have a problem. Um, there are some people that also use cattle tags to keep the flies off the dogs, especially um, one member in Georgia um, is doing it. And I think Crystal is doing it down in Lano um, because her dogs are on a big, big range. So she's not necessarily seeing fly strike starting the day it starts. It may be, have happened you know, for a couple of days and the dog was out on range with the, with the sheep or the goats. Um, so um, taking a cattle tag and um, zip tying it to the collar is something that some people do. Um, 
I, I would recommend at least having a discussion with the veterinarian if you're going to be doing that to make sure that that doesn't somehow um, be a contraindication with something else that you're giving the dog, like putting uh, front line on the dog and then having a cattle tag on the dog, that kind of thing. Um, but again, um, working sort of hand in hand with, with somebody knowing exactly what products you're using and being able to research it for you um, can keep your dogs a lot more comfortable. Um, and then able to handle it, handle your dog, able to dress. And this is what gets back to that socialization and why I threw those couple of slides in at the beginning. If you have an animal that's well socialized, when you need to get your hands on them, you can. And you can address these things early and get it taken care of. Um, if it gets to where it's not something you can, something you can take care of, again, you're able to handle the animal, you're able to hold the animal so that the veterinarian can do something with it. There's um, <clears throat> nothing more frustrating than be called out on a call and say, well, you know, I think that dog has a broken leg, but we can't get our hands on him and he's on the back 40. Can you catch him? Like, how do you want me to catch him? You know, um, most veterinarians don't carry dart guns. And <laughs> I don't know that it would be feasible to use on a dog effectively anyway. <coughs> so in summary, owners, you gotta be able to handle your, sorry, Owners, you have to be able to handle your animals, and that means socialize them. Doesn't mean they have to be in your back pocket, but you ought to be able to get your hands on them. Somebody ought to be able to get their hands on, get a hand on a collar. Um, if you can't, if, if you, if it's a problem, like I said, that's something you can't address, like a broken leg or a huge hot spot or something like that. Um, it's easier for me, us as veterinarians, um, to work on the animal if you're able to get hold of it. Um, and then we often can achieve better outcomes. And it's a lot less stressful for the animal. The animal is not just out of its mind with fear um, because someone is touching him or her. Um, and again, livestock protection dogs, they're an investment, they're integral to us as producers, to us as you know, hobbyists, which I guess is what I am now instead of producer, um, but they're, they're integral to our success and to the safety of our livestock as well. Um, so if you might be sensing a theme, that, that's the theme of the talk. <laughs> okay, anybody doing any chat questions? Oh, maybe one, hang on, sorry. Okay, Nadine, Western Tennessee has deer infected with chronic wasting disease. Is there a concern for our dogs? Um, that's a really good question. Um, chronic wasting disease is, um, uh, it's a prion disease. So it's like, it is mad cow disease. It's just the, the deer version of it. Um, I don't think that it would really be an issue unless your dogs are consuming your brains. So if anyone's hunting in your area, um, probably any of the offal from your hunting, you probably don't want to throw it to the dogs. Um, and I really think the brain is really the area that we would be most concerned about. As far as I know, um, I don't think there's been any documented case cases of chronic wasting, scrapey prion disease in canines, canids, whether it's coyotes or, or whatever. Um, I would be concerned um, also with you know, any hoof stock that you have in the area. Um, and again, it's one of those things, there's nothing you can really do to protect them. You certainly don't want to be encouraging deer to come and hang out in your goat area and goat yard. Don't be feeding them and bringing them up. You can enjoy looking at them. Um, and there are now actually, at least in dairy goats, they've been doing some genetic testing for scrapies resistance. Um, there's an ethyl that that um, dairy goats can carry um, that can conceivably give them some resistance. Um, and anytime you would have animal exhibiting any kind of odd neurologic kind of problems, um, me as a veterinarian, the first thing I worry about is rabies, of course. Um, but then the second thing one should consider is scrapie as well. Um, doesn't seem to be a huge problem in no longer a huge problem. It was a big problem in sheep. Um, and 
gravy actually came from um, sort of the symptomatology of it. The sheep would be act like they're just really itchy. I mean, they'd be rubbing, rubbing, rubbing like crazy, pull, you know, rubbing wool off, that type of thing. Um, but they found a genetic component, a resistance component um, with Q and R. And I believe that the black headed sheep tend to be resistant. Whereas the, what, the old style white-headed sheep, rambolets, things like that, that haven't been crossed out to some plaques, um, have more of a, a susceptibility to scrapie. And the other thing with scrapie is, is if you do have a diagnosis of it, I mean, you definitely want to know if you have it in, in, your, in your area. But if you do have a diagnosis of scrapie, any animal that has been exposed in that flock, let's say, if they don't be resistant, then they need to be destroyed. They will be destroyed. And you get indemnity and things like that for it. But it's really kind of a life altering situation if that happens to your flock or your herd. Um, animals that carry resistance get a buy. They don't have to be destroyed. And then you're kind of doing a five year monitoring program for any additional cases of it. Um, so that's why it was became a really big deal for sheep producers. Um, and it, more of a deal for those of us with dairy goats. I'm not sure about boars and kikos and things like that. I would expect they probably have the potential to carry the resistance allele or, um, um, you know, it might be something worth, worth investigating, investigating that. Okay, another question. Um, livestock feed, feed additives that are harmful to dogs. Tamara, you asked that question, I bet. <laughs> and um, yes, I think I didn't get into a lot of how to feed for dogs. Um, there are certainly better diets for our dogs. Um, I tend to be one that likes to do uh, a higher protein, higher fat kind of diet for my dogs because they are so active and busy. Um, it helps me keep weight on them. But um, by going to higher protein does not mean a totally grain free diet. So I'll just I'll kind of go in that direction and I'll answer this question. So we tend to feed feeds that that are you know balanced nutritionally, um, but we don't do these kind of weird boutique feeds that are like absolutely grain free, no 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 grain at all because there has been some data that has shown that those type of diets um, can cause uh, cardiomyopathies. So it's something that one needs to be aware of and better to stick with a balanced nutritional diet that's something formulated by nutritionists who pretty much know what they're doing. Um, in terms of feeding our animals, we feed our dogs um, just once a day. Now, some people have free choice feeders out and if that works for them, that's great. I personally like to feed my dogs once a day because I feed them at the same time the goats are getting fed. And that way I don't have young goats sticking their nose in the bowl to eat dog food. I really don't want my goats eating dog food. Um, a little bit probably doesn't hurt, but if they really go to town on it, we could get um, over disease, clostridium, things like that. Um, the other thing we can have is a dog protecting its food and snapping the goat or doing, you know, making a mark on the goat or damage or whatever. Um, my perfect livestock guardian dog, if, if a goat does come up to check out what they're eating, um, perfect livestock guard, guardian dog at our place is one that just buries her head in the food and eats faster. So that they, so it, so it doesn't, doesn't really get aggressive with the goat, but it's just not really going to let the goat in. Okay. Um, you know, some protection of food, I think, understandable. Um, my issue with dogs that really, you know, bark and snap over the food is that dogs only kind of have black and white. They don't have gray areas. And I at one point had a dog um, here that ended up not really working out as a livestock guardian because he was so resource protective that not only would he, you know, not you know, bark or snap if somebody came near the food, but, but then chase the goat 20 or 30 feet away um, to keep him away from its food. And I thought that that felt that that was inappropriate um, and often um, was grabbing at stuff and trying to make marks on the animals. So I um, prefer if everybody gets fed at the same time, they know where their bowls are, um, food's down, they eat, we pick up, they don't leave anything in the bowls. Um, and that also tells me the dog's eating well. If, a dog, if one of my dogs doesn't come up and eat, 
uh, you put down the bowl and they kind of eat half of it away. Something's not right. And I need to get hands on that dog, get a temperature, start looking them over and see, see what's going on. Okay. Um, now in terms of feeds that are um, problematic for goats, uh, for, for dogs. And again, this is why I don't, I don't want the dogs eating the goat food either. The goats don't eat the dog food, the dogs don't eat the goat food. And the reason is, is that there are some feeds that are high in cottonseed, cottonseed meal, um, those kind of things can carry um, a chemical called Paul. And especially in young animals, um, young dogs um, that are not ruminant animals, those mm. gossipol can lead to cardiac problems. And so it's something that, again, it's easily prevented if everybody sticks and eats their own food. Nobody eats everyone else's food. Um, so that's something to be aware of. If you do have dogs that are going after the goat feed, if it, you can't address it with a creep feeding or some other system, then at least make sure uh, of what's in your food. And so that one of the things would be gossipol. Another one would be some of the um, drugs that we put in feeds to prevent coccidiosis in young animals. So rumensin um, is just really toxic to horses, um, um, but it's a great coccidiostat for goats and sheep. Um, and another one, um, losid, which is something that we, we put in the milk of our young kids, um, but there's also a, an additive that can be put in feed as well. So when I'm feeding, I, I, I don't dam raise my goat kids, they're raised on a lamb bar with CAE prevention, which is a whole nother thing. But um, I, the, once a day they get lacellosid in their milk as a coccidia prevention. Um, so when I have leftover milk in the lamb bar after the kids are done, we don't pour that in a and give it to the dogs. If we have leftover milk that doesn't have anything in it, the dogs love it. And our dogs here love goat milk and they actually eat brie and other things, cheeses that I make as well. But, but one needs to be aware of some of these things might be okay for ruminant and they're not okay for a monogastric like our dogs. Okay, and then I have another question from Melissa. When does a puppy have immunity after the first set of shots? And in the first puppy shots, is it safe to ship the puppy? Okay, um, that's a good question because we don't know. The first set of shots, if it's given at six weeks, it may or may not have immunity. Um, likely eight or nine week shot, it's gonna develop immunity. I guess if I was shipping animals, I really wouldn't want them to be going any sooner than maybe a third shot at 12 weeks of age, partly because of the immunity, and also um, because of the puppy sort of some confidence in itself and not creating a, a stressful situation. And Tam, I'm going to call on you to answer this a little bit too, because we had a discussion with a litter of puppies that we had here as to what age they could actually leave. Um, you know, often you hear people getting puppies at eight weeks, you know, from breeders, you know, house dogs and things like that. But I think it's a little bit different with our animals that are with livestock. Um, I think that um, I don't ever want anything to leave here before the second shot and preferably 10 days after the second shot. I feel like it takes seven to 10 days ought to be safe to allow time for immunity to develop. But as Anna's pointed out, you don't know if that first shot is really taking effect or not. And so when you wait that two to three weeks for the second shot, um, you might, that puppy might have gone for a period of time and be uncovered actually. Having purchased a puppy with one shot and having had it die of parvo many years ago, uh, I became very cautious about that. And recently we have had a bout with parvo with a, co a group of co-owned dogs, a co-owned litter. But does that answer the question then? I, I, would, I would ship on the second shot if we were 10 to 12 days after that second shot. Okay, that's all I have to say about that, I think. You're muted, Anne. Anne, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm muted because I was getting feedback and making echoes when you were talking. Um, 
so um, Nadine asked a question, um, is cotton seed safe to use for animals in the winter? Um, and I, I sent her a direct message, but Nadine, if you just want to unmute yourself and explain, explain yourself. Um, I didn't know if you meant as bedding or straw or whatever. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, we actually have been using cotton seed, not knowing that it's not good for ingesting, but um, we've been using it for bedding in the wintertime because it's supposed to, the holes of the cotton seed are supposed to um, keep them warmer. And so we put it into their kennels in the wintertime to help them stay warm. So we put cotton seed and then we put a layer of, of straw. Okay, so thank you for that. I've not ever heard of doing that. And um, the, the, the holes can, not all cotton seeds, different varieties of cotton seed carry different levels of gossipol. Um, so, um, I would, I would be somewhat reluctant just because especially puppies eating stuff and things like that. I, I think if you can find an alternative, um, that is, you know, less iffy, um, that you would just not be taking a chance. Cause the thing with gossipol too, is it, it doesn't just like instantly like, oh, they ate some and now they're vomiting and they have diarrhea. It's a process that affects over time the development of the cardiac muscle. And it's generally the younger animals that are more susceptible, young growing animals that are more susceptible to it. Um, but it doesn't mean that an, an older animal wouldn't also be affected. So I think I would kind of not do that. And I also wouldn't use it then as bedding in areas where the dogs are, let's say with your livestock protecting, protecting them because they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get into whatever. Okay. Yeah, we hadn't heard that. So that's a great, great piece yeah. of information for us yeah and it may be that the holes don't carry as much as the kernel or seed itself um but it's something i, I guess i just wouldn't even want to mess with personally okay great thank you uh, okay somebody had a question about ofa x-rays pen hip versus ofa for akbosh at what age can these x-rays been be done um and tamara i'm going to call on you again because you did a bunch of pen hip on a bunch of your young animals the, the nice thing i will say is pen hip can be done at a younger age and so you can get a good idea of whether this animal is going to have good hips or not um in general, it doesn't seem, at least with the Akbosh lines that I've dealt with or Tam has dealt with, that we tend to have a hip dysplasia problem. So Tam, you take it. Okay, um, I think you're really right in that if you breed dogs with moderate bone and um, good muscle mass, which we know muscle mass is inherited. That's the reason we breed beef cattle versus dairy cattle. Uh, they've done research with greyhounds and a greyhound raised in an apartment has as much muscle mass, not in the same condition, but has the same amount of muscle mass as a dog coming off the track. So breeding for the right kind of structure helps. But we prefer pin hip because it measures one inherited trait. And that trait can be measured, pin hip says, as early as four months. I disagree. <laughs> we did Congo puppies at four months and got very bad scores. And at 12 years, the dogs were still sound as a dollar in their hips. So I think it was a problem with they were they were they had not yet developed enough to actually be done um, with any degree of confidence and accuracy. We recommend pin hip anytime after the age of eight months. I encourage people to do it um, around 12 to 14. But we've done dogs as late as seven and eight and gotten good hip scores back. Um, OFA is a very different kind of evaluation. It's done by three vets. It's a rotating panel. Uh, it changes, I think, maybe quarterly. I'm, I'm not sure on that. And they evaluate a variety of uh, factors in the x-ray. And none of those is one single heritable factor. So I think OFA is a good way to know what this dog looks like on this day. We use pin hip because it tells us 
it evaluates a trait that is actually inherited. So that's what I have to say about OFA. OFA, you cannot do until the dog is at least 24 months. Uh, and with Akbash, I've known Akbash that came into their first heat at 18 months and their next heat at close to four years. So it can really put the kibosh if you have genetically valuable dogs in a breeding program. So that's about all I can say about that. I hope that answers your question, Melissa. Okay, and then Laura made a side note. Um, when you could send a puppy out or take take one to different states have pretty different states have pretty strict laws regarding minimum age and not just for breeders. Um, I guess that that is true and thank you for sharing that. Um, we always need to if we're shipping animals or taking animals even to another state we need to be aware that their requirements are. Um, some states want the animal to be vaccinated for rabies so if that's the case sometimes you can't send a puppy to a particular person until the animal is 14 or 16 weeks of age. Okay, I hope that kind of answered or addressed that or kind of added to that. I don't see any other questions. Okay, everybody is, I appreciate it. And um, hopefully those who didn't have questions, hopefully I just answered them before you had them. Um, but if you certainly, if you think of any other things after the talk, like, well, what about, um, oh, that's a good note, Chris. Crystal just made a note that puppies under eight weeks are too young to sail. I didn't even realize that. Okay, good to know. Um, that wasn't something that has ever been on my radar. Um, but if people think of questions later on, certainly the Facebook forum is a great place to throw questions out there. Um, it's not meant to be a veterinary forum. Um, I'm just going to put that out there. I am semi-retired veterinarian. I certainly want to help any of my fellow Akbash loving people with anything. Um, but nothing, Facebook pages or, or whatever, really replaces um, the, um, the value and the need to have a, a veterinarian that you can work with and have a direct relationship with. Um, they're you know, instrumental in helping you when your animal's sick, for sure, and also in helping you keep your animals healthy, as well as a resource for you as well. And I think once they understand what these dogs are and what they do, and um, I think that they, especially if you have an animal that is socialized to where they come out to your farm or ranch, you know, they can get hands on and do things with them and, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. I think it makes a, a big difference in terms of the relationship you have and their availability to help you um, when you have issues. Anything else from anybody? Okay, good deal. Well, this has been fun, folks. I hope that you got something out of it. Um, and hopefully we'll have other topics, maybe not just veterinary type things in the future for, um, for folks. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. You are Thank very you very welcome. much.